Thank you, Cameron and Kristen. Probably because I turned that fan on it blew your music away. <clears throat> but I'd rather be cool. It was a little warm where I was sitting. Take your Bible to the book of Hosea. To the book of Hosea. I've got a host of Eddie's family over here to, to my right. Glad they're here. Have some of our family here. Have some friends that, uh, from Teague that are here today. And glad that they're here. And glad that you're here. I'm glad I'm here. But I'm more glad that the Lord's here. Amen. We have been making our way through these minor prophets. The last, we, we actually began before Christmas. And uh, we picked it back up here a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so we're going to continue that today. And uh, so, sort of the way this works is, is, is it was the job of God's prophets to bring God's word or to bring more times than not more than just his word, his warning. He would have a warning for his people about their sinful condition and the way they were living and the things that they were doing. So, so he, would, he would appoint a prophet. And we've been going through the minor prophets, and they're, they're not minor because their message is less important. They're minor because they didn't write as much. So if I were a prophet, I would have to be a major prophet because I'm long-winded. So we're doing the short-winded minor prophets in, and, uh, in, in, our, in our study. And uh, last week we talked, about, we talked about apathy and America. And this morning we're going to talk about hope and America. Hope and America. There was a line, and I, I, I was mentioning last night, that if you ever hear me make a statement about a scene in a movie, that I probably didn't see the movie, I just heard about it or read about it. Well, one of the few movies that I've seen in my adult life was the movie Rain Man. And wasn't it Dustin Hoffman? Wasn't he the, the guy? And, and one of the statements that he made in that movie was, and it was just a passing statement, was he said, he, he made a statement concerning Qantas Airlines. And his statement was, Qantas Airlines has never had a crash. That was his statement. And, you know, and, and I looked the other day on, on the internet and I kind of Googled that and just to kind of see where it would carry me. And, and unless it's happened pretty recently, they, they've still, that's still a true statement. And uh, it was a statement, though, that just kind of went, went by the by the wayside in, in, in the midst of that movie. Well, what happens, and I don't know if this is at every airline or not, but at the majority of airlines, they have, a, they have what they call a squawk sheet. And a squawk sheet is just for the pilot when he will finish a flight. He can, he can write down a minor problem that he encountered with the airplane or something along that line. And, and he can write down that, on that squawk sheet the, the problem that was there, and, and he can turn it into a, a maintenance engineer or a mechanical engineer, and they will, they will take care of that minor problem before the next flight. Well, here, here are, I think I've got five of them, five or six here, that, that are actual squawk sheets that were turned in by the pilots of Qantas Airlines and those that were turned returned as the maintenance engineer would fix it. One, on one of them, the pilot said this. He said, left inside main tire almost needs replacement. The mechanical engineer replied, I almost replaced the left inside main tire. <laughs> on another, the pilot said, test flight okay, except auto land was very rough. The engineer responded, auto land is not installed on this airplane. <laughs> on another, the pilot said, aircraft handles funny. The engineer responded, aircraft warned to straighten up, fly right, and be serious. <laughs> on another, the pilot said, target radar hums. The engineer responded, reprogram target radar with lyrics. <laughs> another, the pilot said, mouse in cockpit. The engineer responded, cat installed. <laughs> On the other, the last one, the, the, pilot, the pilot wrote this message, said, noise coming from under instrument panel. Sounds like a midget pounding on something with a hammer. 
the mechanical engineer responded, I took away the hammer from the midget. <laughs> God sent prophets. And I define prophets, this is not a literal definition, it's just my definition because I'm simple-minded. It was God's man with a word from God for the people of God for a particular time and situation. Well, God sent prophets to the nation, to the nation. And, and the reason that he did this, that he would continually send these prophets, both the major and the minor, is because he wanted to keep his people the same way the squawk sheet works at the airline. God wanted to keep his people from crashing and burning. And God wanted his people to, to straighten up and fly right. And God wanted his people to do the right things and, and all of those things. So, so, so they would fill out a, a, a spiritual squawk sheet and, and it would be a report of the nation's sins. But, but not only did the prophet of God come and say, here's the problem. There's a mouse in the cockpit or whatever the problem may be. But God not only sent word that, hey, there's a problem. He sent a solution to the problem. He sent a remedy. He, he, never, he never pointed out a problem that he didn't send a solution to go along with it. Well, the same is true in this, in this book of Hosea. Now, the book of Hosea, and I know it doesn't get preached from very often, and, and, and I don't either, but, but it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. How many of you know the story of Hosea? Just be honest. Not many. I, I want to tell you, the story of Hosea is probably, well, I know it is. It is the second best love story in the Bible. First would be John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. And, uh, and the second would be the story of Hosea. Now, if you don't know the story of Hosea, I'm, I'm, I don't do this very often. I'm going to tell you, you hold on as long as you can with going to the bathroom. Okay? I'm going to tell you, the story of Hosea is a wonderful, wonderful story. And it's a story about how God teaches us about his love. His love for his people, he teaches about his love, he teaches about his grace. And, and I want you this morning when you leave here, and Rick changed my clock, so uh, he played like he did anyway. And when we leave here, I want, I want you to know how special the story of Hosea is in the Word of God. So you begin reading with me. We're going to read several passages through the book, so keep your Bible open to, to the story of Hosea. But we will begin in verse number 1. In verse number 1, the Bible just says this, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, where was Judah? North or south? Southern kingdom. That's right. We learned that last week. In the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Where was Israel? Northern kingdom. Well, you learned something. Here we go. Second verse. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went, this is Hosea, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibline, and she conceived and bore him a son. The Lord said to Hosea, Call his name Jezreel. The name Jezreel means scattered. That's the first child. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel in the house of Jehu. And bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And, and she conceived again. Gomer conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him. Call her name Lo Ruhama. That means no mercy. And, and, and it goes on to say, For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, 
nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Verse 8 says, Now when she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo Ami, and that means not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Here's what I want us to do this morning, is I want us to look at the story of Hosea in three ways. One, as a symbolic story. Secondly, we will look at it as a prophetic message. And thirdly, we will make a personal application, if time permits us to do that, of the story of Hosea. First of all, we look at it as, the, as a symbolic story. Symbolic in what nature? Well, it, it would be this. It would be Hosea's love for an unfaithful wife. Hosea's love for an unfaithful wife. Now, to get where these people are as we read this passage of Scripture, we have to go back over 2,800 years. And in about 2,800 years ago, in a small village in Israel, there lived a young man, and his name is Hosea. And, and on one particular day, at some point in time, God spoke to young Hosea. And he said, Hosea... He said, I want you to get married. Well, Hosea is probably a young, maybe old teenager, young, young adult age fella. And, and then God says, Hosea, I want you to get married. And I just have to imagine that Hosea is excited. Good. Good. He said, I, I want, I've been wanting to get married and, and all of those things. And he says, well, that's what I want you to do, Hosea. And, and he says, I've even got the right girl picked out for you. He said, I want you to marry a girl named Gomer. Now, that's not a pretty girl's name today, but it was all right back then, 2,800 years ago. There wasn't a lot of choices back then, so they wasn't real picky. But he said, I want you to marry Gomer. Well, Hosea, he smiles and he says, all right. He says, that's good because, you see, he's heard about Gomer. He's heard of Gomer, and he knows that Gomer is a pretty girl. He knows that she's, she's very attractive and, and, and that a lot of people like Gomer. Well, God said something else. And it didn't make Hosea smile. And Hosea didn't say, all right. But then God said to Hosea, he says, Hosea, Gomer's a prostitute. Gomer's a prostitute but I want you to marry her anyway. He said, I want you to marry her and get ready, Hosea, because she's going to be unfaithful to you and she's going to be unfaithful to your children. Well, Jose, have you ever heard that? I thought of this this morning. you ever heard that recording of a, of a phone call from God? Any of you ever heard that? Go home and Google it and listen to it. it, it, it it's quite funny. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, this came into my mind as I was thinking about this early this morning, that, that, that after God told him this, he's going to marry a girl that she's, going, she's a prostitute and she's going to be unfaithful to him, going to be unfaithful to his children, that old Hosea had to sit there and say, do what? Said, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what I want you to do. And, and, and listen, most of us will admit that, that God sometimes asks us to do some things that are strange. Some things that seem, seem strange in our life. But here's what Hosea did. He obeyed God. He went and he married Gomer. And, and, and I believe that he was in hopes. I believe he was in hopes that, that his love would prevent from happening what God told him would happen through the, through the course of their marriage together. And for a period of time, I, I don't know how long, but for a period of time, things went well. They were blessed with three children, and everything seemed to be going good, and, and, and it almost would, would seem like that maybe God missed this one. But one day, Hosea got up and he went in the kitchen to have his bowl of Cheerios or oatmeal or whatever they ate back then, and he found a note on the table. Some of you have had a note like that in the course of your life. And that note would have said something along this line, Hosea. 
He said, I'm tired of being married. I don't love you. I, I, I'm tired of pretending. I, I, I feel like that I'm trapped. I want to live. I want to love. I want to come. I want to go. I want to do. I want to laugh. So I'm leaving you, Hosea. He said, it's over. It's done. Don't come looking for me. Well, you can imagine the pain and the heartache that's in the heart of Hosea. You can imagine it. It's like that proverbial spear being driven in, into his heart. Well, that's where old Jose is at in this, on this particular morning. And, 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 and that, that's what is happening. His heart is broken. Well, well, we don't know because the scripture doesn't give it to us. We don't know how long Hosea, I mean, how long Gomer leaves. We just know that they're the parents of three children. She gets up on this particular day. She says, I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And we don't know how much time elapses. But some period of time begins to elapse. And she's separated from Hosea. And we don't know how many men that she would have welcomed into her life. And how many men she would have had quote unquote relationship. But the scripture does give us infer to us that her life it just begun to spiral out of control. Gomer becomes nothing but a piece of property that's for sale to the highest bidder. And the Lord spoke to Hosea again. And it's in the third chapter, flip over there. In the third chapter, the first, beginning with the first verse, Hosea speaking, and he said, Then the Lord said to me, Now get this, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. Verse 2 says, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers, that's about a bushel and a half, of barley and I Hosea said to her Gomer you shall stay with me many days you shall not play the harlot nor shall you have a man so too will I be toward you did you catch what he said in essence, he said this, you're going to be faithful to me, and I'm going to be faithful to you. That's what he told me. So here's what Hosea does when God speaks to him. As Hosea, I don't know how he comes about. I don't know if he's a wealthy man. I, I don't think he is. But he gets word from God. And God says, Hosea, I want you to go again. And he said, he said, he said, Gomer's being sold as a slave. And he said, I want you, Hosea, to go and buy her. Hosea, he gathers all of his goods. He might have had to text his mom and daddy or send out a tweet or run by the bank to the, to the whatever that thing is that you go by, the little instant banker thingy and get a cash deal on his debit card. But he gathered all the money that he could find. In fact, he was so desperate and that, that I, I'm, I'm just picturing this. As he left home that day, he seen, he seen this bushel and a half, or, or, or as the Bible calls it, this homer, homer and a half of barley. And he says, I'll take that with me too. And he goes to this auction. And they parade out Gomer. 
not just a slave, his wife. And she probably stands before that crowd of people being sold as a slave naked. And she is standing there and, 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 and this is the scene. And, and the guy that's in charge of the, of the auction of the selling of the slaves, he says, well, who will give something for her? And somebody shouts out, well, I'll give ten pieces of silver. And Hosea says, I'll give eleven. And somebody says, I'll give twelve. And Hosea says, I'll give thirteen. And somebody says, fourteen. And Hosea says, fifteen. And somebody else may have said, and I'll give fifteen and a bushel of barley or a homer of barley And he's down to all he has. And Hosea says, I'll give 15 and a bushel and a half. And whoever he was in a bidding contest with probably just flips his hand at him and says, Hey, you can have it. She ain't worth it. But Hosea pays with all that he has to get Gomer back. And now that he had her, the thought has to come, what am I going to do with her? Because you see, by the Mosaic law, it is within Hosea's rights to accuse her publicly and have her stoned to death. And had that happened, nobody would have questioned that decision that Hosea could have made and was covered within the law. And, and not, only, not only that, but, but that also would have restored his standing among the people. That would have restored his standing as a man of righteousness. He, he, he also had the right to, to, to take her and say, Okay, Gomer, you've been living like a slave, so I'm going to make you my slave. You're going to work from sun up to sundown. You're going to work your fingers to the proverbial bone. And, 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 and you're going to repay what it cost me to buy you. He could have done that. And he would have been legally covered by making that decision. But instead, Hosea approaches Gomer. That's the way they sold slaves a lot of times back then, is naked, so you can see what you get. And Hosea probably took some garment that he had off. It may have been, a, been this coat. And he walked to Gomer, and he took that coat and he covered her with that coat of some sort. And, and, and he, says, he says, listen, I know what you've done, Gomer. I know the life you've lived. I know the decisions you make. And then he says something along this line. But I forgive you. And I love you. I forgive you. And I love you. I want you to come back home. I want you to be my wife. And I want you to be a mother to our children. Now we sit here today and we say, man, what a story. I wouldn't have done that. I'd have told her to hit the road. But you've got to remember something. Are you ready? That, 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 that thought that I just mentioned, that, that's a thought we would all have. I'm going to tell you, your pastor would have that thought. But here's what Hosea is doing. Hosea is representing the love of God. Because that's just what that's just what we did for us. We were Gomer. We were Gomer. I was Gomer. You were Gomer. We were dirty. We were undone. We were sinful. We were all of those things. And I tell you this morning that he paid the he paid the highest price there was to have us back. Now, we talked about this word about a month ago. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout it. Hallelujah. You can shout better than that. Hallelujah. 
That's the symbolic story. But there's also a prophetic message. And the prophetic message of, of this story of Hosea is, is simply this. God calls an unfaithful nation to return to him. God calls an unfaithful nation to return to him. Now, now Hosea's marriage to Gomer was a, we, we, we could call it today, a living parable. A living parable of God's relationship with Israel and, and with any nation that wanders from him. And I'm going to tell you today, and we know this is true, America has wandered from God. Can't you imagine that? You know, God, God told the Israelites. He said, you're like an unfaithful wife. You, you, you're like an unfaithful wife. He said, you're guilty of spiritual adultery. And Hosea, he could have, he could have said in that relationship with, with Gomer, he could, he could say with passion, and he could say with honesty, because remember, Hosea, he's just not a part of the story, but he's delivering a message from God, a message of God to the people of God. And he can say with passion and honesty, I know how God feels. I felt the same way. And then he's able to tell Israel and Judah, you've broken the heart of God. Who loves you. You've broken the heart of God. So, so here's what God does. He gives, he gives Hosea a vision for the future. Now stay with me. We're, we're still in chapter 3. Turn, turn to the fourth verse. This vision of the future that God gives Hosea concerning, concerning Israel. It's a time when, when Israel is going to return to God. And here's what it says beginning with verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, verse 5, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So that's why I tell you that this is a prophetic message. You see, you see, America is not Israel. And I told you that several weeks ago and I'll reiterate that to you today. But, but there's a recurring historical pattern in Israel's history that's true in our history. Let, 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 me, let me give you this pattern. It has three stages to it. First of all, God blessed Israel. Well, God has blessed our nation. God has blessed America. And I'm, I mean, it, it's more than just a song that we sing on patriotic holidays. God bless America. It's more than that. I'm telling you, that, and I'm not a history buff, and I'm not a, I'm not a history expert. But if you get down and you look at the history of our nation, the providential hand of a holy, sovereign, and righteous God is all over it. I know we don't teach it anymore. I know that it's not a part of the curriculum of school anymore. But Hosea points out that from the very beginning of his dealings with Israel, that God had blessed Israel. He had, he had done that. Here's what we read. Flip over to the 11th chapter of Hosea. Here's what Hosea says here. He says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, this God saying, out of Egypt, remember this? I called my son. You drop down to the fourth verse and, and, and the word of God tells us this. I drew them with gentle cords. With bands of love. And I was to them who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. I tell you, God blessed his people. God blessed Israel. God took care of Israel. And I tell you, the same can be said of our nation today. The same can be said of America. We're all familiar with the date, July the 4th, 1776, aren't we? Everybody know what that date is? 
I hope you do. It, it, it's the date of our, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But how many of us know what happened 40 days before that? Forty days before that, here's what happened. It was on May the 17th, 1776, the Continental Congress. The Continental Congress called the citizens of the colonies. They called them all together. They sent out a massive text to everybody in the colonies. And they said, listen, he says, there's going to be a time of fasting and prayer. This time of fasting and prayer is going to last for 40 days. And listen to me this morning. I, I know there are people that say we're not a Christian nation and those guys that founded our nation were this, that, and the other and deist and all these things. And I, I understand that, that, that many of them were. But I'm going to tell you we were founded on godly principles. And, and they weren't going to sit down and sign that Declaration of Independence until they spent 40 days, not 30 minutes, not a, not a cottage prayer meeting that we might have before revival. They were going to spend 40 days in prayer and fasting. And it was only after they spent those 40 days in prayer and fasting that they sat down and they signed our Declaration of Independence. Just like Israel, God blessed this young nation. God blessed the young nation of the United States of America, even in times of great trouble. You know, last week I mentioned the first two wars that we entered into that we didn't win. Well, we won some wars a long, long time ago that we didn't have any business winning. Did you know that? When we were just a, when we were just a young nation, we entered into a battle that is called the War of Independence. And we didn't have any business as a nation winning that war, but we did. We did. And God moved in a, in a great way when, when the British surrendered at, at Yorktown. And, and only 31 years later, you say, well, that's a long time. Well, it's not when you're a baby nation. 31 years after that, we were back in war again. And it was the War of 1812. And it was during that particular time that for one of the two times, and no, no, it's the only time. One time in our history where the capital city of our nation has been occupied by enemy troops. And it was on August the 24th, 1814, that British General Robert Ross attacked Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. only had 8,000 residents. 4,000 of those were slaves. And, 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 and so there, there was very little resistance. There, there, wasn't, there, wasn't, there was no defense. There, there, there just weren't any. So, so very easily the British captured Washington. Dolly Madison cooked supper for the troops, for our troops at the White House. And, and, and she cooked supper for those American soldiers and, 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 and all of those. And, and, and Ross and, and, and his brigade troops, they set fire to the White House. And they set fire to, the, to other public buildings. And, but the next day, the next day an odd weather phenomenon occurred. Hurricane-type weather doesn't, doesn't get that far up the East Coast very often, but, but on this occasion, a hurricane roared ashore. There was torrential rain. There was wind to beat the band. and You know what that rain and wind did? Put the fire out. It put the fire out. The winds extinguished the fire. The White House wasn't completely destroyed. Tornadoes 
tornado spawned off of the hurricane that came through. And, 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 and history says that more British soldiers were killed by the tornadoes than were killed by American defenses. You say, what, 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 is, what does that mean, Brother Steve? Here's what I believe it means. That the providential hand of God blessed the United States of America. Amen. He took care of her. And he honored her. Fact is, as General Ross, after this weather and all set in, he, he decided, we're leaving. On his way out of town, he, he stopped and he asked an American lady, American woman. He said, great God, madam. He said, is this the kind of storm that, that you've become accustomed to in, 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 this, in this, he called it an infernal country. He said, is this what you've become accustomed to? And the lady answered this way, quote, no, sir. This is a special interposition of Almighty God to drive our enemies from our city. You probably won't sit down and read the local history book and find that. But I tell you this morning, and I think I can do so with, 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 with history and, the, and with the authority of the Word of God, that God has blessed not only the nation of Israel, but God has blessed our nation. God has blessed our nation. Well, here, here's the second part of the pattern. Not only has God blessed our nation, our nation has turned from God. Our nation has turned from God. Now here's Hosea's charge against Israel was this. You have committed spiritual adultery. You have committed spiritual adultery. Remember last week we had the, the, the plumb ball, plumb, plumb line deal? Make sure. But we had one. And, and we talked about how, how God hung that, and hung that plumb line and, and, and he was saved through his prophet. Last week he said you have strayed away. The, the, the wall that you have built is crooked. Well, well, well God's people, Israel and, and Judah, they had, they had turned from the true God. And they had begun to worship false gods. And, 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 and you see, th th this description of, 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 of God's people, both kingdoms, th this description, 20, almost 3,000 years old. 2,800 plus years. But man, it fits us this morning like a glove. Here's what, here are the words that come. This is in the fourth chapter and the first verse. Hosea says this, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord, listen, to this, is, this is pretty tough language. He says, for the Lord brings a charge Against the inhabitants of the land. Now they weren't being charged by the deacons. They weren't being charged by the church council. They weren't being charged by the WMA. Where did this charge come from? Where did it come from? Yes sir. Here's what he said. There's no truth or mercy. Or knowledge of God. In the land. That's a sad statement, isn't it? Did you hear that? There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. <laughs> You say, Brother Steve, big boy, how has America strayed from God? Let me just give you two ways. One, I believe, and both of them are moral issues. One, our Supreme Court, I'm going I'm to cut this short. Our Supreme Court just last year struck down a law 
It was a 4,000 year old definition of marriage. And our Supreme Court, by the vote of five to four, they said, you see, just a few years ago, and I believe it was in 96, we had, we had an act that came up, and it was called the Defense of Marriage Act. And the Defense of Marriage Act simply did this. It just reiterated what had been true for almost 4,000 years. And that was that it defined marriage as one man and one woman. And that passed the, the houses of our government at that particular time by overwhelming majorities. In fact, here was the vote. In the Senate, it was 85 to 14, and in the House of Representatives, it was 342 to 67. We had the Defense of Marriage Act, and President Clinton at that time in 1996, he signed it, and it became law. Well, in 2011 our current president, he told the Justice Department, he says, don't defend that anymore. Don't defend that. In fact, we want to we repeal that and replace it with a respect for marriage. Respect for marriage act. And then to make a long story short, on June, on Friday, I remembered it was a Friday, Friday, June the 26th, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court said, we're going to recognize same-sex marriage in the United States of America. Now some people say, well, Brother Steve, we're living in different times. We're living in different times now, and modern times call for modern morality. I want you to understand something this morning. I want you to understand this, first of all. God loves homosexuals, and we ought to do the same. But I'm going to tell you this morning that my Bible teaches me that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And, and if you go back in your Bible, you will find this truth, that homosexuality is the sin that brought about the judgment of God on a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't like it then, he doesn't like the sin today, and he's not going to like it tomorrow. See, up until just a few years ago, we really didn't have the term homosexuality. That's a, that's a, that's a way that we've kind of glossed over the term. The, the, the term was sodomy. Sodomy. And up until 2003, now this is only 13 years ago, up until 2003, Sodomy was still a punishable crime in the United States of America. And still today, it is still a punishable crime in 70 nations in our world. I'm not attacking homosexuals. God loves them. He died on the same cross for homosexuality as he died for my sin. Right. I'm not any better than any. But I'm going to tell you, it's wrong. And it is a blight on our nation whom God has blessed. But I think there's a moral issue that pales in comparison with same-sex marriage. You say, well, Steve, what, what in the world could that be? In 1973, I was 10 years old. In 1973, our nation legalized abortion. Now, that just kind of flies over most of our heads. I'm going I'm to put, put a number to that for you this morning. And I just looked this morning to get the latest number that, that the Right to Life, uh, whatever it's called, website printed. And this was about, this was about 7, 7.30 this morning. That number, from the time they legalized it till about two and a half hours ago, is 58 million. 
586,256 babies that we have murdered. Murdered. You see, before Roe versus Wade, abortion was a crime in America, punishable by law. Punishable by law. We have missed the impact in our society. We've missed the impact in our churches. We've missed the impact in our schools. We've missed the impact in our government of 58 and a half million boys and girls who, by the way, they would be 43 years old today if they were. We sit around and we wonder, well, why isn't there a cure for cancer? Why isn't there a cure for Alzheimer's? We may have, we may have killed the one that was going to lead us there. You say, why aren't there good people to run for president anymore? We may well have killed them under the guise of, of, of choice. Choice comes before the sex act. Pardon that from the pulpit, but just, just the way it is. Our nation has turned from God. The third part of that pattern is this. I may have to quit with this. Our only hope is to return to God. Our only hope is to return to God. Hosea's message to God's people, to Israel, So not only have you broken God's law. You hear, I know know it's close, getting close to 12, but you hear this. Not only have you broken God's law, but you've broken God's heart. You know, thanks to us as a nation. We not only break the laws and break the commandments and all of these things, but but when we sin and when we stray away from God, we break His heart. That doesn't, as as a parent, doesn't it break your heart when your children go astray? Doesn't it? Sure, it does. That we're we're past the day. There was a day when when they lived at home there, if they began to go astray, you could get them up and give them a whooping. But it gets to a place where that's not, that's not possible anymore. And, and when we see our children, if they begin to stray away from God and they stray from the principles that we tried to raise them with and teach them, it breaks our heart. Well, when we as a nation, when we as God's people, when we stray away from God, I'm telling you this morning, it breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God. In the 14th chapter of Hosea, first two verses we read these words, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to Him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. So what's the application, preacher? We need to confess our national sins. Not blame somebody. Don't blame the Democrats. Don't blame the Republicans. Don't blame whoever you're not. We need to confess our national sins and return to God. That's what, that's what needs to happen. Well, you, you notice this. In spite of Israel's sins, and, and, and God already said, He says, your sins as a nation are that you have committed spiritual adultery. Well, in spite of that, are you getting this picture? In spite of that, God was willing to draw them back. God was willing to draw them back to His heart 
It's the same way that, that Hosea was willing to receive Gomer back. I don't want you to be my slave. I don't want to take you out and publicly denounce you or stone you. I want you to come back and I'm going to love you as my wife. God, draw, God is drawing Israel back and God's willing to, to draw us back. And, and, and listen, here's, here's, what, here's what the Bible says. This is back in the second chapter, the 14th and 15th verses. It says, therefore, behold, I will allure her will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her, will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Hang on, we, we've, got to, we've got to step. How many of you know what the valley of Achor is? Now, now here, here's what it is. When it says the valley of Achor as a place of hope, let me tell you why that's, why that's relevant. The valley of Achor, A-C-H-O-R. It was the place where Joshua, we have to go back in time, where Joshua had directed the Hebrews to stone a fellow by the name of Achan. Remember that? He told them to stone Achan. He said stone his family because they had gone in and what had they done? They had stolen some of the things that they were not supposed to steal and take. Not only did they steal, they lied about it. So the valley of, of Achor is a place of misery. It's a place of horrible memories. When they would think of the valley of Achor, nothing good came to mind. But, but listen to this. He said, he said this in this verse. He says, the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And then he says, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Don't you know they were excited when they got to leave Egypt after those 400 plus years of captivity? Yeah. God offered them hope. And God offers you hope today. He offers you hope. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's, it doesn't matter who it is. There's hope for America. There's hope for you. But I tell you, our nation's return won't begin at the White House in Washington. It won't begin at the State House in Austin. It won't begin at the courthouse in Lufkin. It'll begin at the church house. It will begin at the church house. If there's going to be hope, and there is hope for America, if we're going to begin to realize that hope, it's going to begin to take place when God's people, and if you're a born-again Christian, that's me and you, when God's people get serious about living out our faith, in Jesus Christ. I don't have time to make the personal application today, but I'll tell you this. God loves you and God loves me so much that he paid the greatest price known to man so that we could be saved. So we could be saved. God Almighty gave His Son to die for your sins and mine. And listen, God knows all about you. God knows all about your past. God knows all about my past. God knows all about your present. God knows all about my present. God knows all about your future. God knows all about my future. Even so, He still loves us. He's saying, come. Come. <clears throat> he called Israel. This morning, he's not calling Israel. He's calling you. And he's calling me. To, to leave the life of spiritual adultery where we allow other things to be the God and Lord of our life and come and follow the one true God. I'm going to 
long day. About 10 minutes from right now, I'm going to walk out that back door. And when I do, I'm going to walk out of here knowing, Lord, to the best of my ability, I told these people who are gathered at Trinity Baptist Church this morning, I've told them the truth according to what I believe that the Word of God says. Now, we're at the time where we need to respond to the call and the Word of God. If you're here today and and your life is amiss, if you're living in what we could call spiritual adultery, He's calling you to come. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, He's calling you to be saved. There's nothing else that He has to call you for until you've been saved. If you're here today and you've been saved, but you're not living for Him. You're not faithful to Him. You don't do all of those things. He's calling you back just like like old, old, old... Hosea went out there and called Gomer back. He says, you're not going to live as my slave. You're going to live as my my wife. And he's calling us back to that relationship. You see, when, when we get to this part of this service, it's not up to Brother Steve. It is now between you and the God of heaven. What will you do with his word to you this day? Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts.